Hey, I'd like to welcome you to our October webinar. We are glad that even if we didn't call you by name, we're glad you're with us. And I know this time is gonna be well spent. Um, be sure you're muted while the session is going on. And we will have a short question and answer afterwards. So if you have a question, just type them in there and we'll get to all of them that we can at the end. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Kurt Bonk, professor at Indiana University. Dr. Bonk's academic interests include online learning, MOOCs, open education, collaborative technology, informal learning, emerging learning technology, self-directed learning, and blended learning. So he <laughs> pretty much covers everything. He has authored many widely used technology books, and he has published in more than 130 journal articles, 65 book chapters, and 20 books. In 2020, he was awarded the Indiana University President's Award for Excellence in Teaching and Learning Technology. So Dr. Bonk, we will turn it over to you and we are looking forward to your presentation. So I see Wellesley Fauché, is that Rob Fauché by chance? I'm, I'm thinking- he's still, he's still connecting, that's him. Okay, well, Rob, it's great to have you back when you do connect. Uh, and Kinshuk is coming in too, so thank you for attending Kinshuk. Um, you know, I, I'm just in awe to have people who are celebrities as famous as Madonna and Pink in the audience with us today. Um, it's, it's great to have all of you here and be able to present to Peking University before and then the Texas here right after. Um, I will say that uh, on a few hours sleep, I woke up with a little bit of a sore throat. So it'll be time. I've got four beverages in front of me. None of our are alcoholic in nature, but I do have four different things, including a cup from Taiwan and other things. Uh, this is kind of a special talk in, in, in some ways because it's it's it relates to work that I've been doing in my entire career in some ways. And that is to utilize technology for global means to connect people in unique ways so as to foster the perspective taking of individuals, uh, departments, and entire cultures. And the movement and the possibilities in education today enable us to do more than ever at, at the blink of an eye. I have a guest coming into my class tonight who was my mentee 15 years ago at Illinois, now is, is working in the higher ed setting. And, and every week I'm bringing in different people, including Rob Fauché last semester, in fact, including Lin Lin this semester, in fact, including Yo Joanne this semester, in fact. Uh, so there's several of you. Uh, and Mena Ju here, who, again, I just presented with, has come to my class many times. So I'm bringing in folks so students don't just read their vanilla bland articles, they get to see them. And I'll be talking about two different uh, portals, if you will. And these portals of video enable us to tap into the rich resources of the field without costing any money uh, to the students and enabling them to hear about the history of the field and look back as well as the present, what kind of research is being conducted today, and the projections towards the future. And that, th those three things are enabling students to get excited about a discipline, not just hear about the importance from their professors, but the people who have been creating the models, been creating the in innovative projects and initiatives and hear what happened, what didn't happen, where they're going next, what could happen. Uh, as Rob Fauché pointed out in, last spring, where you can get a job. <laughs> he pointed out after coming to the session, he probably the most important thing that Rob, you talked about was providing a summary list of, of jobs in the field and advice for everyone as to where they wanna go. So I'll be, I'll be tapping into some of that today in this talk. Uh, and I've been involved with Chris Deedy at Harvard with Punya Mishra at Arizona State, who is known for the TPAC model. 
Uh, Chris Didi is one who I read in graduate school uh, and was excited about his future visions. Now I'm every week producing a podcast show with, with Chris Didi, with Punya Mishra, with Young Zhao at Kansas. Uh, and so the four of us is, have, are on now episode 80 or so. So I'll be summarizing that uh, afterwards, not right away. First, I'm going to look at the AACT Legends and Legacy videos and what they offer to us uh, as educators, as instructors within the learning design and technology field, or whatever name you want to give it. Uh, these uh, portals of rich interviews of people like Michael Spector, that, that you all know quite well, uh, enable students to touch base with someone, to feel someone, not just read the article that they've written, okay? So let me go in uh, and share my screen if I can. Uh, and this is the first time I'm giving this talk. I've given, this is my last talk I gave again this morning. It was the first time we summarized eight studies on self-directed learning in a little over an hour and a half. Uh, yesterday, I gave a talk on informal learning to Butler University, the first time I ever gave that. Uh, and last week, one to Korea and one to Japan. So it's, this is my fifth one of unique things. So it's going to catch my breath every once in a while. Um, this is, I titled it, um, and thank you, Lin Lin, for asking me to give this talk. Uh, because she knew I was doing this thing every Saturday, <laughs> at normally at 5.30 Eastern time in the afternoon. And she said, how would you like to talk about that thing, silver lining for learning? I said, well, I don't want to just talk about silver lining for learning. Let's talk about the ACT legends and legacy videos as well. And so I've been using them to change my classroom uh, aura, in effect. Talk titles from legends and legacies to silver lining for learning, tapping into history while tapping into the future via video. And anyone can, can check out the ACT legends uh, videos. You know, Barbara Lockie is the one who's uh, spearheaded this initiative for a long time. And I was asked to uh, write a, a little historical blurb or piece for Tech Trends uh, uh, two, three years ago about how I'm using the ACT Legends and Legacy videos in my own classes. This is a two or three page article, it's very short, but it kind of epitomizes or summarizes how you could use these um, really informative, historically rich and deep um, videos that are available to anyone at the touch of a button. And what I'm doing in, I'm teaching a class for the, well, for the first time in 2015 or 16, and I've been in my, you know, I've been teaching for 30 some years. I said to myself, you don't know anything about this class. What are you going to do? You know, and I, you know, I started thinking for a bit, well, there's these ACT legends and legacy videos out there. And there's a whole bunch of folks that can teach this class a whole lot better than you can. Um, so I started tapping into these in different ways, showcasing uh, people, show, uh, talking about specific um, concepts within the field, highlighting them and looking for themes and patterns across. And so this particular introductory class was actually one that was, how should I say, it was not well attended and was actually dying out. It was actually a course that kind of, maybe we need to delete the course. Well, I've used these Legends and Legacy videos as one aspect, it's not the, the full solution, but one leg or a piece of a pie in formulating and revamping this course, and now it's got it's over full. Um, so it's not just because of these, but it's a part of it. It's creating that sense of um, of the field, of the community, um, the history, the historicity of the field, and letting people tap into and learn from who, these people who have been leaders um, for the last few decades. And so. I, I recommend highly that you take a look at, at the Leg Legends and Legacy videos. I'm not going to show any of the videos today, by the way, but it, there are links are in there. If you want to listen to David Jonathan, my good friend, for 35 minutes, describe his evolution within the field, his directions within the field, whether it was from North Carolina, Greensboro, I think, on to uh, University of Colorado, Denver, where I first wrote to him back in the mid to late 80s and got an immediate response via regular mail uh, from David. And then Penn State and then Missouri, he talks about his, his, uh, his migration to different places and what he was involved in, where he sees the field going. 
Uh, he was unfortunately died too young. Uh, for all, all of us were impacted by his, his, his work on computers as, as cognitive tools or thinking tools or mind tools and constructivism and, and other areas that he, in which he worked. He was really uh, a leader in many aspects of cognitive theory and constructivist theory within the domain of learning design and technology. And not, not, um, not shy about debating uh, in, on a main stage with other people and their viewpoints. And so he got me to think as a graduate student going to AERA every year about the debatable topics in the field. And now to hear him on video and to watch him and my students can, so my students can watch these, they can pull out concepts in our face-to-face -face class, put it, put them on display and show, share them that way. They can watch Ivor Davies, who was a faculty member at IU when I started. He's still alive. He was two blocks away from me, or I can jog to his house, but maybe more like a mile away from me. But Ivor was, is a leader within the field, and you can hear from him, can write a paper on it, can reflect on it, can actually email him and interview him to ask him his opinion since he did this historical uh, video. Or Mike Melinda, who created the class that I'm now teaching that was dying out. He created the class 40 years ago, and there's a video of him in the Legends and Legacy um, uh, website. And he's come several times into the class to talk about the history of it and 40 years ago, why he developed the course and where the, the underpinnings of most of the concepts and where he thinks it's going today. And Mike's recently got a new book out. Uh, an instructional design related book, I believe with Rutledge. And so he's still active 15 years after retiring in the field. And you can hear from Michael Spector and, and my friend Marcy Driscoll at Florida State talk about Robert Gagné and um, his um, research that he did and how he actually walked into classrooms and studied uh, the lesson plans that were delivered before coming up with his instructional design sequences and outcomes and so forth fascinating 57 minute uh, tribute to Robert Gagné. And you can't get this anywhere else. I mean, really, you, you literally cannot get this anywhere else. I've, I've done flipping the classroom where I've recorded a lecture on Gagné. I've got a podcast on Gagné. My, my students can watch this, but this is so much better. The Legends and Legacy video that, that's available on Gagné because the, the stories are deeper. I, now, I met Gagné a couple of times, but I don't know him as richly as Marcy does and as, as Michael does. And this is what uh, the videos can do, is to tap into their storytelling knowledge. Really, these, this website is about the stories that Rita Ritchie at Wayne State. I think Mena might have actually, I don't know if you have replaced Rita, but, but you work in the department where she once was. So Mena Jew is with us today from Wayne, um, my former advisee. But again, we just presented to Peking University. <laughs> ah. But you can hear from Rita. And I remember reading Rita's work in graduate school and being highly influenced by, by her books and her thoughts and her ideas. And to then think about it decades later and watch her describe why she wrote that book and what, what her perspective was is really more enriching for me uh, than the original course that I took at Wisconsin on uh, that covered instruction design models uh, from uh, Dr. Michael Stribel taught that course. And, you know, Mary Herring and others uh, just add to the, the uh, depth of knowledge because they're, they're going through how they got recognized, what, what led them to, uh, in their reputation, what kind of projects that, that built their careers. Um, I found that fascinating as, as well. Uh, as what you're listening to Michael Spector. Now, this is one, if Michael's in the audience, I will say that when I teach this course face-to-face, -face, I show this one and the David Jonathan one every semester, not the whole thing, but pieces of it because Michael's background is so fascinating and his perspective on how the field changes and the questions that we're asking today and why that is. Um, he's got really unique uh, perspective and point of view. Plus, he's one of the most prolific people in the field. If you need a paper to be written, you, you give Michael an hour and he'll have it done, you know. So we've got these, these uh, Legends and Legacy videos. Think about, and, and again, I wrote about this in an article called Tapping into History via Video and Listing the, Le the Legends and Legacies of Our Field. And you can utilize these uh, 
potentially by having your students write to the authors. I mean, most of these folks are still around. And so writing to these people um, is one way they could enrich their knowledge, watch the video, write to a set of questions, or maybe have your class brainstorm questions for them and then uh, write them emails or meet them at a conference. Or what I've been doing is invite them into your class after watching the video in Legends and Legacy and then having a series of questions around it. Or you could have students role play or do debates and assume the persona of that person after watching that video. And you could have um, a series of panels because there's so many, I don't know the exact number, someone might look this up, how many are in the Legends and Legacy video website, but you could have each of your students, if you're teaching 20 students, you could have five panels of four students and each of them watch a separate video and become that person in a role play or a debate or some kind of active uh, in an engaging setting. So, um, so Lin Lin has answered the question, I think. I'm not sure, I'm messed up here uh, in the chat window. Um, there's the link to oh, no, to a different article, but um, my point was there are spin-offs, derivatives, all sorts of pedagogically engaging things that you can do with this canned videos. Now, there are ways to get students engaged in, and having them be the designers, having them interview one of these people at a conference, or you could set up as a class to meet with different people at the ACT conference for an hour each. Maybe you take the, an afternoon and you have four or five people in, uh, who are historically, um, who historically have provided important and momentous uh, contributions to this field. And every hour you could be set up to meet one of those like Dr. Melinda or like Dr. Spector or other people. And um, that'd be one way, or if they're passed on, they're uh, advisees. There are people who are you who had them in class, interviewing them as well. So there are many ways to take these videos out of the dry talking head arena, and having them add to it. And there are tools that which enable people to tag or add comments on video, which is uh, annotation kinds of tools, which is another way that might enhance uh, further. Uh, so let me go back to the videos. Uh, so. So there's some links to the Silver Lining for Learning website and the Silver Lining for Learning every Saturday, normally at 5.30 p.m. Eastern time, we stream to Facebook from YouTube and you can ask questions. You can come in and ask live questions every week in one of our episodes in Silver Lining. We started Silver Lining with COVID. I started running March 21st. We started filming March 21st, 2020. It's been 584 days since then. I've run every single day. Um, so I wrote this article for Tech Trends three years ago or so about this. But eight years ago, Dr. Mimi Lee and I wrote an article called uh, Through the Words of Experts, Cases of Expanded Classrooms Using Conferences, Conferencing Technology for a, a journal from Yonsei University in Korea. This article, I think, is probably, well, each of these has a different slant on how to use shared online video to enhance the pedagogical aspects of your classroom. This one has more of a focus on K-12 settings, but it maybe is split between K-12 and higher ed. And so we, and, and I'll talk about some of the activities that you can use next in the sequence next. The third article on using YouTube anchors and enders has 10 ways to use shared online video from an instructor point of view or instructor centered and 10 ways from a student point of view, being uh, student generated or being you know, more participatory learning, contributory learning. And it uses John, Br John Bransford's macro context or anchored instruction as the underbelly for it, the theoretical underbelly or schema theory in some ways. Bob Appleman and Ken Hay and I, in 25 years ago, a quarter century, we combined two video conferencing systems together the fourth article is here in, in EdTech Magazine. Uh, in actually, it was 1995, so it's 26 years ago now, almost. Um, and uh, we combined PictureTel and CUCME technology together. And I think we were the first ones ever to do that. CUCME was built by Cornell University. And we had students 
um, who were in Indianapolis at IUPUI, students in Bloomington. And that's the Bloomington School of Ed right there. It was built in 92. Um, it's now being remodeled, remodeling the library and other things. But at the time, it was, it was a demonstration site for technology and education. It got lobbyist money from the federal government to do innovative kinds of things in the building. So our mission was to experiment. Our mission was to train. Our mission was to uh, do research on what was happening within that, within that building in terms of educational technology. We are advancing the mission, the cause for um, educational technology across the, education, across the disciplines in, in, in the university. And so we were, we were testing this video conferencing out to IUPUI, but I said, well, what if we, what if we layered on? Is it possible to, to add CUC me into this? And so um, Elliot Soloway on the right there from Michigan, who's still around, still my good friend. I had read about him in, before graduate school. I read AI and Education, Triple AI um, magazine, and he was cited in there many times. And he's such a character. And then David Palumbo I, I, uh, comes from, um, he was working at University of Houston Clear Lake at the time. And uh, he got his degree at West Virginia University where I got my first faculty job. So I knew David. We read their articles during the week on the impact of computer programming on thinking. They had both written about it, Latin as logo, um, or logo as Latin, I guess. Basically a notion is if you, you, know, you learn to program, you're helping, you're, you're enhancing your higher order thinking skills. My students debated this in Vax Notes. They wanted nothing to do with it. They were saying this is a lot of bonk and not, not you know, a lot, of, a lot of junk, a lot of bonk. This, you know, they were bashing, they were trashing Elliot Salway. They were bashing David Palumbo. I mean, we were training, we were training students to be critical. I mean, I was reading these things. I'm like, oh my God, are they right? And, and then I said, you know, we, we, this is asynchronously. And then we brought the folks in synchronously and Elliot looked like Santa Claus in this, you know, this, the, the quality of the video wasn't really great, but you could hear him. He had almost like a white beard. And this is the only time I had faculty walk by my classroom and walk into the classroom to hear what was going on. It was so fascinating. They found out that one article doesn't represent a person and people's ideas change over time. All the people who were bashing the articles during the week were shaking their heads yes on everything Elliot had to say, everything David had to say. It didn't matter what. We asynchronous first, then synchronous. Kicks, kicks this. It whacks them in the side of the head. Kicks them in the seat of the pants. Wake up, people! You don't overgeneralize from one article, you know. And it was so. It was a top ten event in my. And I've been teaching thirty three years. This is a top ten event. And so we wrote it up about how to apprentice students learning through using Vax Notes asynchronously, using um, CUC Me and Picture Tell synchronously, and having a discussion in a face to face classroom and other things in the classroom how you could kind of tele-apprentice their learning. And this got me started in, in an era of bringing guests into my class. Now, I didn't do it much during the 1990s because it wasn't that prevalent, but I did bring people in from, I remember from Malaysia, um, from uh, Finland, and from other parts of the world came into my class and we did video conferencing activities with the University of Askila and Oulu from Finland, uh, from Korea, from Kyunghee University, and from Malaysia, the Open U. Um, and so this got me started. And you all should think about how you can combine sync and async. You know, we ban, by the way, we don't, we can't mandate students to use synchronous at IU. We'd get lower rankings in US News and World Reports if we mandate to be there at a set time and set place. So, so the silly powers that be don't let me have a mandated synchronous. I have to make everything optional. <laughs> everything is optional. And so, you know, I might bring someone in over Adobe Connect, like my former student, Min Young Du, who's now publishing tons of things with me and, and Mina and others. Um, and she's coming into a little demonstration in, in the old uh, Adobe Connect or Breeze. We did research on Breeze and when it started out, we had a paper called Life is a Breeze. And then they changed the name to Adobe Connect Pro. So we changed the paper titled Life is an Adobe Connect Pro. It just didn't work that well. But anyways. Um, for a long time, I used Adobe Connect. Ellen Wagner was a good friend. She worked at Macromedia, and she said, Kurt, you need to use Adobe Connect. And oh, okay, we'll use Adobe Connect. You can do Japanese tea ceremonies. And there was a project at Indiana called the ISIS Project. Not the ISIS you know of, but the International Studies in Indiana Schools, where they can get rural farm kids in southern Indiana and Greene County nearby, hearing about Japanese tea, tea ceremonies or 
um, you know, Korean food or whatever is is um, the the weekly topic. Now, Dr. Mimi Lee at Houston studied this for a dissertation, so that got me kind of interested in for colleagues, and we studied video conferencing to get forced to global exchanges, if you will, and, and perspective taking. So I want to enhance social cognition. My ultimate goal when I, I left the field of accounting in 1986, I said, number one thing I want to do is enhance perspective taking in this country. I wasn't successful, as you can see. I also developed ethics cases for Arthur Anderson right after that. And I wasn't successful at that either, if you know anything about Enron. Um, <laughs> as a former CPA, they thought, well, you can write ethics cases for us. Ah. Maybe they didn't use them right. Anyways, I'm still working on this uh, social cognition thing, and I think the world needs more attention on this. So I'm keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing because I think this is this is the way we open bridges up, not close them down. This is the way we make the work world open for learning, not close. Uh, we make it open. The world should be open. And so I try and make my books free and open online. Ebook free. Go to techvariety.com. Mena, you can put it in the chat window in Chinese and in English. She just did that last hour, so she knows the link. Um, so, you know, you can bring in guests into your class. So, Rayel Junko is an expert at social media or Twitter. When we were studying Twitter and the impact of Twitter on learning and all this, well, why not bring him in? Well, I wrote to him. He was at Harvard at the time. I think he moved to uh, Iowa State. For a bit, he was at Purdue. He says, I don't have time. I don't have any time. I said, well, don't worry. We'll design the talk for you. And so my students looked at all his research and designed PowerPoints based on his research. And they put in the chat window, they put questions for him. They put comments, quotes from his articles, his own articles. Well, he says, I can do that. I can come in. I don't have to prepare nothing. This is another top 10 thing. Because he could say pass if he didn't want to talk about it. He could talk about the figures from his research article from uh, on Twitter or whatever. Uh, and I see Scott Warren needs to be admitted. Uh, so I'll let Scott back in. Scott, thanks for coming back, Scott. We missed you, Scott. My partner in espionage. We're doing research on espionage. Anyways, so, um, so Ray Junko comes into my class and was brilliant. This is the most spontaneous thing because he doesn't know what what articles we're going to call up. He doesn't know what figures are going to come up. He doesn't know what comments are going to come up in the chat window. And so, um, you know, my student um, Umida there from Uzbekistan is asked a question and he, boom, he's answering. Just, it was just brilliant. And then we did the same thing the following week with Steve Carson from MIT, who was, was well known for his data on OER and open courseware. The MIT was one of the first ones in an open courseware. And so uh, Steve would always give me the data. And so I would just put some of his charts up there and he would just, you know, uh, here's where MIT is going. Here's what's happened in the past. Instead of reading the articles from Steve, it was much, much more engaging because there's stuff that doesn't get in the article. The publisher cuts out or there's some, something that's happening next. Or, you know, there's a, a meeting that just happened at MIT, you know. So I interviewed Dick Liu, in fact, the guy who, had the idea for open courseware on his rowing machine. And everyone at MIT said it would never work. You know, Richard Liu, who is an engineering guy. And, and a week later, they said, oh, what about this open courseware thing? Let's maybe try this out, you know? And so, you know, you never know what might come to your brain while working, uh, exercising on a rowing machine. So, I, you know, I also had David Merrill. And the same thing happened. David Merrill comes in and, you know, he says, well, sure, you know, I'll talk to your class. My, but my students, you know, there's uh, my, my two students, Teresa and Maggie um, from uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan there. And, and they were master's students in language ed. And they're asking him questions. He's answering them. But what he doesn't realize is we discussed in, in, in Sakai or in, in on course, you know, his, his research. Or we were using maybe a Blackboard or whatever we're using. And they hated his articles. They hated David Merrill. They hated everything. They were, they were bashing him again. And it was all asynchronous. And first principles, none of that. They don't want anything to do with that. All, all crit but we brought him in live. They're shaking their heads. Yes, everything, everything. Same thing happened the second time. I'm like, this is weird, you know? This is really kind of weird. There must be something that can, we could maybe create an instructional design model or maybe write a book about 
weird things that happen with instruction when you combine synchronous and asynchronous together, you know. So we tend to be a society who's, oh, it's all, we can move to asynchronous. Oh, we're all moving to Zoom. Oh, no, we got to move back to asynchronous. The world, the US news and world report. It's weird stuff. You know, it's all weird stuff. So, um, so what, if, if back in, in uh, 2012 or 13, my students said, how, you know, I said, make a recommendation who we should bring into the class. And one of my students, Bill Ball, he says, Dr. Bong, how about, he, 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 how about you bring Obama's top ed tech person into class? His name is Rich Collada. <laughs> he says, this is a challenge for you, Dr. Bong. And, and we went and used the um, IQ wall in our cyber infrastructure building. So we had this gigantic jumbotron wall that we're bringing guests into the class. And all these multi towers, the biggest multi tower wall in the world. And, and what he didn't know is Rich Collado is my friend. I actually was giving him advice on how and his career. So yeah, Rich popped into the class, talked about the, what the US government was doing for educational technology and future trends and future um, uh, grant monies that were available and all that. So, you know, it, you get students' solicitations. And this semester, my students said, Dr. Bunk, you've got four young. Uh, people in the field, but you got a lot of older retired people. How about we want more younger persons and, and, and females, but we got a lot of females in the class. So uh, Anita Ross from the University, of, uh, well, she got her degree at Houston. She's at Baylor now. And she came in, she's fascinating. She's an old friend, fascinating. To, so getting student recommendations as to who to bring in. Make a list of who you know. You know, if you know IntelliGirl from Second Life, and you see me in my pink hair, you know, I don't have my pink wig with Yes, I, I know IntelliGirl, I know Punya Mishra, I know all, I make a list every semester. I have a list of about 20 to 30 names. And I put Rob Fouché's on the list, as he knows, Lin Lin's on the list, Yoon Joanne's on the list. And, you know, we, so that, that's how I, I, I look at the list. Who, who matches up? Whose articles are we reading in week six and in week seven and week eight? It doesn't have to be matched up exactly, but we want to have some people we bring in whose articles we're reading so we can we can get students excited about what they're going to read. So we're reading an article from Punya. Punya is my podcast partner. And Punya came in two weeks ago. It's fascinating. It's up there on YouTube. It's a link's in there. You can watch the interview we did. He does amograms where you can write words one way and turn them around. He's known for the TPAC model. If you, so, so Punya came in using um, Zoom, Zoom to it. And I invite people from other places, former students, friends, colleagues. It's not just for my class. I make it open. I make these sessions um, open to anyone who wants to pop in and ask a question, which makes it a different ambiance. It makes it a different kind of environment for learning. So it's not about learning in my class. It's about learning for life. That's what I'm trying to teach them in the introductory class. I don't care what they learn in the class. I don't test them. I have it. it the task. I have lots of tasks. I have a multiple choice tests, you know, silly little things. I want them to learn and, and give a lot of energy into what their interests are. And, and, and I give them a lot of options, a lot of choice in what that is. I bring Lynn Lynn and Yoon Joe. You see them right here, August 21st. They came in. So I, pairs. Once in a while, I bring a pair. And I thought this pair would be a good pair because they're at North Texas. They're in mid career. Um, uh, Yoon Jo's going up for FOPA. She should get it, hands down. She's so dang smart. And Lin Lin, uh, oh, the two of them are also did a research with me last year on gamification of MOOCs. So that's that's the reason. Well, that's the reason I brought them in because they're my research colleagues now. And uh, so fast, they were fascinating. And it was really great that they could pair off ideas against one another and, and add to what each other's saying. So that's one idea that you can use. Um, also, uh, bring in people for expert interviews and discussions based on their resumes or their biographies or their books. Richard Bayer, I brought in. You can get the link there. He was uh, hands down. It was we had students from around the world. Everyone wanted to hear Richard Mayer, you know, the most prolific educational psychologist in 2001, and he's not slowed down. 574 articles later, you know, the guy's amazing. And I brought Terry Anderson, who developed the journal IROODL and the, the communities of inquiry model and other things. He was right after Lin Lin and, and Yoon Jo. He was three days later. Um, so I'm, I'm just, and, and we're reading from him, by the way, you know, we read an article from him. So I matched up the article we're reading from. We read from Richard Mayer. We watched his videos in the Legends and Legacy videos from AACT. 
And we bring Tom Reeves, and I'm looking at the time, so uh, I want to make sure I get the silver line because that's why Lynn Lynn brought me in here. So um, Tom Reeves came in to talk about authentic learning a few weeks ago. He was going to come with his colleague, Ron Oliver. They've got a book on authentic learning. We had a time zone in Aust Perth, Australia, time zone issue or something happened, but we'll, next semester we'll rectify and bring both in. Um, Tom, as you know, is my partner in, in several kind of books that we've done together. And so um, I, we could talk about many, many, many kinds of things. And he's come several times in the past to talk about design-based research and other things uh, with my class. So an expert, so he, this can be archived. So the videos can be archived and next semester students can mine those for concepts, for ideas. So you can save them and look at when Lin Lin asked a question of Tom, what was the question you asked Lin Lin? You probably don't even remember, well, I'm sure. And, you know, I had a fascinating chat with Kyle Peck at Penn State. I had another one with Tim Newby at Purdue, a couple, both a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, I, I came out of both of them saying, God, I wish I would have worked at Penn State. God, I wish I would have worked at Purdue. Or didn't say that. Did I say Purdue? Purdue? Um, but I really thought both of these guys, I, I, I could have worked with Terry Anderson. I could work with Lynn Lynn. I could work with you and Joe. I wish, you know, there's, I could. So my students are saying the same thing. So, wow, I would like to go, you know, meet these people at a conference. I'd like to uh, chat with them, send them an email. That's, that's, you know, I'm getting excited when I meet them and finding out about them. I mean, the stories Kyle was telling about his early life before he got into grad school and what led him to grad school is fascinating. His, his uh, work, early work at Occidental with Obama, well, before Obama uh, in California. So why use video? It's a, it, well, it's a way to prime knowledge. It's a way to bring a conceptual anchor and have, you could have later lectures or conversations structured underneath those videos. You can come back to the videos for concepts that you saw over and over again. You can replay pieces and see if they got positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement or whatever behavioral theory that you're trying to teach for that particular week. It fosters deeper sense of learning, as David Ozabel pointed out when he was um, he, um, promoting a schema theory ideas in advanced organizers. Not advanced, or there's no more advanced than an advanced organizer coming before. So showing, showing a short CNN video, BBC video for one minute in economics, um, maybe on the loss of, uh, of housing rates or maybe a loss of jobs or, or whatever it is, having that short video clip can can prime the knowledge, but also provide a conceptual anchor for the rest of your class discussion. And you can come back to it in later weeks. It also gets that dual coding. You can see it with the visual with the video and actually have read it. So Alan Pavio's research and having things verbally, you can re recall it as well as visually. And this is some work I'm sure Lynn Lynn's into this with our media study work and her work on, on neuropsychology and other kinds of things that she's into today. Um, probably is, is extending the work of Pavio. Uh, I think he was at London University in, in Canada. I met his um, son or daughter at a conference a few years back um, and uh, had a nice, rich discussion with them. I really find his work on dual coding to be very relevant because you want to provide multiple streams of information, but not too many, as Richard Mayer points out in his multimedia theory. You don't want to have too, too much or overwhelms, right? And John Bransford's research on macro context, you know, uh, on getting people, and I, and I recommend Mayer's multimedia theory book by all means, but, but John Bransford probably influenced me the most um, in his work on, on Jasper Woodbury, uh, his work on mathematics and, and using these math videos as a conceptual anchor to teach geography, geology, geology, geography, geography, algebra, um, I can't geometry <laughs> geometry not geography or geology to teach uh, algebra and teach basic maths or survey testing or whatever to have these rich short little days not just raiders of the lost ark to teach how many Indian joneses of the hit wide could you replace the golden idol with a bag of sand all those physics and math kinds of questions now he could develop his own videos and with nsf money to to look at and and have um people come back and, and, and reuse them around the country. 
he could create these math videos to get kids around the country to analyze scenarios and situations and develop critical thinking skills and higher order thinking skills by analyzing the scenarios, by asking interesting questions or problems around those high fidelity case situations, if you will. And so you can use these videos and have pausing, pause at any point and have students reflect on them, having key concepts that are played and then have students write papers on them or minute papers at the end of the class. Or start the class with a video, as I said, to anchor the rest of your lecture. Or end as a capstone video. Have Rob Fauché's video from last spring. I put that up a two minute or three minute piece of what he had to say about getting jobs in the field. I'm sure it would lead students into uh, week 14 and 15, which is in this class, in that class, related to competencies and jobs and skills. So having a capstone, having an anchor, um, or having students preview. You might be showing a video in class, send them ahead of time, have them watch it at home before coming to class and have more time wrapped around discussion of it. Or maybe having an archive of all these videos and having students um, mine that archive for themes or key issues or concepts or people that we want to bring back. Having students create their own videos, maybe having video competitions. And that's what I have students develop their own videos showcasing different concepts in YouTube or Vimeo or other some other system or plat platform. Having students do concept demonstrations or having them debate issues through video. It's kind of fascinating having do point counterpoint debates within a video. And that's something my colleague, Dr. Youngju Cho, who's now at Tyler, Texas Tyler, developed. And I really like that where students create short videos with, with uh, debatable topics. And then having, having students interview the, the, the video creator. All these, are, all these are ideas that you can use um, to get the, them out of being just talking head videos. So now I wanna move to silver lining for learning. And it won't take me long to go through a, a series of, of uh, episodes that we've had in silver lining for learning. But COVID-19 hit in March in the US uh, in 2020. And I was in Portland, Oregon, visiting my son. And I got an email request from Young Zhao at Kansas. He said, I'm developing a webcast show. Would you like to join? This is just good. This is going to last two weeks, maybe maybe at two months. It, you know, we'll be back in school. We're supposed to be back in two weeks. But maybe it might last two months. Well, here we are. <laughs> How many months? It's uh, over 20 months later, right? Uh, or about, and we're still about, I'm, I'm getting Canadian, eh? Uh, and we're still in this, you know? And, and so we had COVID, you know, it started and, and, you know, just localized, you know? But then it proliferated world as a worldwide global phenomenon. And, you know, there's a, between 1.4 and 1.6 billion students that's just K-12 students. And then we've got corporate trainees. We've got higher ed students. We've got people in nonprofit spaces wanting training as well. This, the, the number of people impacted is everyone. <laughs> everyone was impacted. And so our show, I think, should have an audience of everyone. <laughs> so watch the show. No, come, come once in a while. Check it out. Uh, so, you know, as this unfolded, we saw ingenious solutions. Many, many people complain about re emergency remote teaching, but that's not distance learning, you know. And so if you want an article, I wrote pandemic ponderings 30 years to today, synchronous signals, saviors or survivors article. I'll send that if someone would like it. I'm talking about the difference between real distance learning and emergency remote teaching. You know, we had this gargantuan experiment happening, one gigantic social experiment in front of our eyes. And, you know, solutions were happening around the world in K-12 spaces, in corporate spaces, in, in nonprofit, in governmental. Uh, and, and, and so we, we wanted to capture that. And so our show recruits people from all over the world. It's called Silver Lighting for Learning. It airs normally at 530 Eastern time. It's conversations about the future of education. 
And this is one a, a picture of the website or part of the website today. It's not the first website we had up there. Um, birth happened on, on March 21st, as I said. I, I went running in Portland after that show, right after. And I've been running every day ever since. My knee is a bit sore, <laughs> my right knee. I'm going to make it to 600. I'm at 585. I'm going to make it. If I'm trying to make it to two years, which is 730. Uh, or episode 100, which will be 742. I don't think I'll make it <laughs> that. I'll make it to 600. Uh, so some of the shows we had, it, you know, the first show was us. So Punya Mishra, brilliant, most creative person I know, uh, got his degree at Illinois with Young Zhao, the two of them. They both went off to Michigan State after that, and then now traveled other places, Arizona State and Kansas and Melbourne. Chris Deedy at Harvard, he was at Houston Clear Lake before this um, and worked for NSF for a while. I think George Mason, maybe for a bit. And Scott McLeod, University of Colorado, Denver, was with us for a half a season. Um, and Shang-Yi Chen from East China Normal has a journal which publishes pieces of what we write up about this. So uh, there's a journal from, from Sage that's um, published through East China Normal University, a uh, review of education, I believe, or something like that. Uh, Maina, if you know that journal name, if you could put it in the chat window, it would help, help me out in the link to you all could publish in that as well. So our first real guest, so four of us were the, just a chat. The first episode was just us reflecting on what to do. Second guest was Sugata Mitra, who, had, who inspired Slumdog Millionaire and uh, has the, the famous hole in the wall project in the slums of Mombay and Delhi, having kids teach each other how to use technology. is sort of controversial, whether you can use a true constructivistic approach to teach learning and be, and create self organized learning environments or souls and have the granny cloud having retired teachers in the UK teach um, content through the cloud out there. Um, and he had a, a, a new book called a school in the cloud. Uh, and so I thought, I thought he, he'd be a great guest. I think uh, young Zhao suggested him. And so we brought him in as our first guest. And as I said, not some people find him to be controversial because of that. And I think that's a good thing. Have your first guest be someone who's a bit uh, controversial in nature. And um, in, in, in his TED Talks, won the Outstanding TED Talk Award. I think he got a million dollars from TED for his, he said three videos in TED, all highly recommended. So you can watch our Silver Lining for Learning show plus TED. We don't look at this to be the end all be all. We don't look at the ACT Legends and Legacies to be all, but it's a resource. It's an open education resource. So Faculty need to think about using OER in unique ways and having your students build OER, right? Having students do things around the OER, like interview Sagata or meet up with him or talk to my friend Sanjay Mishra from the Commonwealth of Learning who came in episode four and his colleagues from Vancouver. Go to col. Um, Maina, if you could put uh, col.org. The Commonwealth of Learning has more free stuff than any place I know for teaching and learning with technology. And they work and help underprivileged youth around the world. They're helping all the former British colonies like in Jamaica and India and so forth. And, uh, and, and they have you know, teacher training through professional development and MOOCs around the world. Mainan had the good fortune to present our research through them about six months or so ago. So we had a session on on, on the Commonwealth and, 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 and the resources. Now, Sanjaya has a book on OER that's free through the Commonwealth, several books. And then we had Paul Kim, my friend Paul Kim, who created SMILE, Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environment, which is an intelligent tutoring or intelligent questioning system, which rates the levels of kids' questions and can also generate questions at different levels. And he's been doing mobile-based learning around the world to build literacy of youth where there isn't a school or for blind kids in India. Um, Paul is a phenomenal individual. He, he's just, he, he's a salt of earth kind of guy. He's at Stanford and my son had the chance to go with him to Argentina and to Tanzania on the SMILE project to get kids to ask questions on their mobile devices of each other to enhance their literacy skills. And so we brought him in 
and he had solutions for people who are disadvantaged on the other end of the digital divide. This was a critical show. If you're interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion, this is the show to watch, or the, this is the show to watch, or this is the show. I mean, they all are kind of addressing that. Some woman came from India and drew our session. She drew the session. She kept coming to her. Her name is Manu Palai. I can't pronounce it. It's an Indian name. And um, she was just, we, were, we have people just popping into the show and doing things like that. So we have every four or five weeks, we just have a conversation with, with each other. We, we, have, we have some side conversations. Some people who are not our guests, we bring on the, on the side. We have extra shows over and beyond, beyond our 80 shows so far. We had the president, we had Rich Pallotta come back, my good friend. He's now the president. He was the head of the U.S. for Obama of, of EdTech. Now he's the head of ISTE. And we had two teachers, the head of the L.A. school district come in, um, so, Sophia Mendoza, and we had Nicole Blanchard from um, Louisiana State area come in to talk about how teachers are preparing for the pandemic during the first summer of the pandemic. It was a fascinating show. We had a student voices show of kids from, from coming from Hawaii, coming from Australia, coming from China, I've maybe one other place. And, and these teenage kids were doing graduate student work during COVID. It was amazing. It was literally amazing. I was just like, I could assign harder things to my graduate classes now seeing this, you know, I'm like, I'm too, I'm too easy on my students, you know. So um, this is one kind of thing we need to do more of. So in the last episode, I was talking about we need more student sessions. We need more teacher sessions about how they're implementing. We had a session um, of three people uh, talking about how uh, immersive learning is used in, Afri in different African countries and, and educational innovation for equity. That was a fascinating show. And uh, they're all three alums of Harvard or affiliated with, with Chris at Harvard. We had Stephen Hippel come talk about you know, the weird machines on the head looking at uh, the room environments. And so you can see whether you're going to have COVID problems or not, the airflow kinds of things. But uh, Stephen's been uh, an innovator in the ed tech space for decades in the UK and around the world. He was coming to us from Spain in that episode. We had Contact North, my friend John Maxim Louise from Ontario, come to talk about how they're getting education out to the far reaches in Northern Ontario to people who don't have high bandwidth and internet connections and, and what Contact North is providing for people to get educated uh, pre-pandemic as well as during the pandemic and how they're ramping up. And I've, I've done several sessions for them since uh, on motivation. We had friends from uh, the Open U of the Philippines, Melinda Bandelaria from uh, um, uh, Open U of, of Indonesia, Terbuka, uh, Tian Belawati, the Open U of Malaysia, my friend, uh, all friends, Sereni Wate Abbas, and then um, two people from the Cyber University of Thailand, Tapani and Jin Tavi, uh, talking about what open universities are like. That was a fascinating show as well. Sheila Jaganathan from the World Bank talking about where the World Bank's um, open classrooms are, are, initiatives are headed, and the MOOCs that they're doing within the World Bank now for poverty, for climate change. Um, financial literacy and other things that the World Bank is providing. So that's a great show. Uh, Sheila and I have done many things together. Uh, we also, my current research, we're at five minutes left. We're current research is with Nepali youth. And so, um, well, we're about to start looking at teenagers taking MOOCs from Harvard and Stanford, but not just English, they're, they're learning English to get ready for college, but then they're taking dozens of more MOOCs. And these high school kids, these 13, 14, 15 year olds came in and blew me away. They were so mature, so wise for their age, Talk, uh, talking about the self-directedness of their learning. There's hope for the world. This silver lining is trying to provide hope for the world, an optimistic vision of what's going on because there's so much negativity happening out there. We do, we are critics too. We, are, we do uh, are, are cautiously optimistic, but we're more of a hopeful show. Uh, more of an optimistic, and this this Nepal show was my favorite, Punya's favorite. Um, it was not everyone's favorite because we had we had too many people in this session. We had two, we had like six kids in one hour, um, but it was a good show. And now my research is going to ask them why are they learning from dozens of MOOCs? What what motivated them? 
you know, parents thought when the internet bandwidth increased in Nepal that the kids would play games. And when they came home from work, the kids were taking English classes from Harvard and getting certificates. We had a, a show uh, with Edgar Leon, my friend there from Puerto Rico, talk about the hurricanes and the, the, the uh, tropical storms and the earthquakes and, and, and COVID and the, the triple convergence of the, and the catch, catastrophes, COVID and corruption. They've had more corruption in education in Puerto Rico than anywhere maybe around the world. So they're facing huge problems, in just all the, all the loss of power, you know, and that was it. And they persisted. They persisted. It was still ha education was still happening despite all the Mar Hurricane Maria and COVID and, and the corruption. And then we had a show where they're ta using taking MOOCs for a cause. They're having kids in the Caribbean, kids in South Africa, kids in Iran, kids in China do a common kind of cl uh, environmental cleanup or uh, planting crops or whatever, doing a, a MOOC as, as, a, as a kind of a group based MOOC called a group. <laughs> Um, MOOCs for a Cause. This is out of Cornell University, it's, um, is the professor in charge. We had my friend um, uh, Cassandra Brooks talk about the Chilean sea bass. You know it as the Antarctic toothfish, or you know it as Chilean sea bass, you don't know it. So she talked about her research in Antarctica and, and the loss of the krill in Antarctica and how they're trying to save the last ocean and working with politicians to save the last ocean. She was a master's student when I wrote the work and interviewed her. Now she's a professor at, at Boulder at Colorado, uh, helping policy changes and, and, and so forth. This is her on the boat, one of many. And this is her ice stories from the Exploratorium, getting kids in schools to interact with researchers in Antarctica through the Exploratorium's ice stories project. So then we reflected on the first year, we had a show we reflected and we started sample 2021. I don't have much time left. I got just two minutes left. So I'll, just mention a couple of the shows. We had Jenny Pennycook talk about penguins, the Adali penguin in Antarctica, which she's been studying for decades or nearly two. Um, she's a Fresno or was a Fresno teacher um, and uh, has a little penguin cam that she sends to 300 schools around the country with uh, curriculum and questions that, that she asks the kids. So it's a NSF sponsored kind of project. It's real fascinating. So what Silver Line is trying to do is look at things that you didn't normally hear about in, in terms of uh, education and, and showcase it. Whether it's my former student, Rovi Brandon, talking about the 60 year curriculum, um, the University of Washington in Seattle has created the Continuum College. They changed outreach and extension to the Continuum College. And he talked about the fact that all the other deans are jealous because he has students for their lives. He has 40,000 students and it's growing in the Continuum College because we need to learn forever, forever. And so, you know, the high flex model you heard of, my former student Brian Beatty developed a high flex model at San Francisco State. You either hate it or you love it. Most people hate it, but they grin and bear it. I used it this semester and it's hard teaching both face-to-face -face and online and you know, making adaptions, adaptations for everybody. But he has a free book and he had two teachers come in to talk about it, uh, how they're using high flex. We had David Wiley talk about open education and the open world. You all know David's the next president of ACT and he's a great guy. I had the privilege of writing a paper with him last year. It's uh, our reflections on 30 years of ed tech. We had people come from East Asia, In Sung Jung, Okwa Lee, and Mei Fung Lu from Beijing Normal, from Kyunghee University in Korea, and from International Christian University in Tokyo. The three of them talked about leadership, women leaders in AI. I think that's a critical topic of getting women leaders. And these are prominent people that I've known, and many of you have known them for a long time as well. In Sung's got dozens of books on blended learning and online ed and other things. And then we had a UDL show with Susan, Susie Gronseth from uh, University of Houston, who just got a standing alumni award in Indiana, uh, early career. Uh, she's talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We had Julie Salmon talk about uh, you know, her work on e-moderating and e-tivities and now digital alchemy coming from the UK. We had uh, people talk about the Horizon reports and their contributions, people from uh, Darwin, Australia, from South Africa and from Turkey, all write, wrote pieces for, for the Horizons report and they, we, we reflected on it. We had five time zones in that session, it was fascinating. 
We had Chuck Zubin and Patsy Moscow from Central Florida talk about their research on blended learning early on and now on adaptive learning and personalized learning and working with now working with diverse learners to get them through high school and into college. And then we reflect, reflect all the time. A show on Costa Rica night school. We had a show on blended learning um, from the um, online learning consortium and the distance learning uh, center at the UW Milwaukee. Tanya Jolston and Nicole Weber talked about their two reports on blended learning leadership and blended learning models that have just come out, sponsored by the online learning consortium. We had Tony Wagner and Ted Dintersmith talk about their books uh, on change and school reform just a couple of weeks ago. And then this is just this past Saturday where we all four reflected on the show and how it went. And um, that was actually of the 80 shows, it's the one I had to leave slightly early on because I had to go to our alumni career award show that night on Saturday. So, so some tips, and you can read these, I won't go through all these, but basically having students write, watch these videos and write papers on it or look for themes in them or uh, write about future trends that they see happening from the themes or repackage, remix the videos and create snippets of various ones into conceptual, kind of conceptual overviews or themes, if you will, or maybe having discussion forums around the videos. So what I do in my classes, or you might role play. So I let my students, if they watch so many Legends and Legacy videos, or they watch so many Silver Lining videos, they can write a paper and delete any assignment. If they watch four or five of the videos, they can delete a midterm. If they watch eight or nine of the videos, they can delete a final. And they write four to five page reflection papers on them. So that's the way in which I get them a little carrot and stick, get them you know, to watch these. And they're very interested in doing so anyways. And so the, there's sort of the steps involved. It's not easy doing each week. You know, you got to contact people. You got to organize. You got to collect their bio. You got to set up the times, you know, all that. It, it takes a little bit of work. But, you know, we've had all these episodes and it's been a lot of fun. We've had 120 guests or more. We've had 80 episodes, over 17,000 views from Canada, Bangladeshi, Australia, China, India, Iran, I, I, Ireland, UK, Turkey, Hong Kong, and US. So looking ahead this week is uh, this Saturday be um, uh, under resource schools in, mid, in, in, in Western and Central China, where they're teaching English once a week from Shanghai or some other place using uh, a technology synchronous. And my student, Sharon Wong, studied this for her dissertation. Maina knows her well. Um, she was a classmate. Uh, and so we have her come in to reflect on the research around that. And, uh, and we have the director of the program coming as well at 7.30 Eastern time, because it's going to be 7.30 morning in China, 7.30 at night in US. So we have a shifting focus. We started with a very negative focus, and now we start, uh, this shows a very lighthearted focus. And uh, we have blogs, we have episodes, we have things that you can get at the website. It's all commercial free. You can use it however you want to use it. Please join us. Please subscribe. Please share us. Um, and so that's the Silver Lining for Learning show. That's the Legends and Legacy show. Uh, both are portals rich with information, uh, rich with contents that you can use. And I'll stop sharing at this point. I was told that I could stay till 1215 or 1115 your time. And you guys could all ask me questions. Um, so good question for Theriel. Um, this is shared at trainingshare.com. So uh, Mena, could you put the trainingshare.com link in there? Um, trainingshare.com, go under archive talks. So you can have this morning's talk on our research at SBL, yesterday on informal learning, or this one, it's all there. So um, you can use it however you want. You know, there's, I'm, I don't own it. Do you guys all own it? Um, my feeling is my knowledge is your knowledge and vice versa. You know, uh, that's how life should be. Um, questions or comments. Thank you, Lynn, for, for the silver lining for learning link in there. Um, and thank you, Mena, for helping me out all along the way. I really appreciate that. 
Uh, any comments or questions from folks? And, and thank you, Kurt, for an inspiring talk. My goodness, so many creative ideas and a reminder that we don't necessarily need the resources, the, the, the textbook. We've got all these OER resources, individual text here that we can. Yep, so, you know, and it can highlight the textbook. And so what I take, I don't do textbooks too much anymore. I get an article from a person that's open access. And so I add the open access article with the video. Maybe I bring them in through a video. I talked, we, we interview them, or we see a prior video that's canned that's already recorded, right? So again, it's a pie. Students can have, you can have lectures, you can have articles, you can have books if you want, you can have videos, you know, you can have open educational simulations and, and games. And it's, it's, it's thinking about an assembly of a curricula that you wrap around and let students choose what pieces of the pie they want to eat. You know, everyone doesn't have to eat the whole pie to learn, right? It's going to get plenty full. If you have four or five pieces of the pie, you'll be plenty full and you can graduate. And you'll be, you'll be a contributing to society. We are, we are so uh, fixated on, you know, getting through, you know, content and, and having everybody read every chapter of a book. You know why? We want more depth. You know, I think Rob would agree with me on this. We want some depth. Um, and we haven't heard from Rob yet. Rob, you have any comments? Are you still with us, Rob? You still here, Rob? You have any comments on this? Uh, yeah, um, Kurt. This, this is uh, this is really. You know, let me get a little closer to the middle of the camera. Uh, uh, hugely interesting talk, of course, and uh, as you always do. The um, um, uh, um, I, I think there are a couple of a couple of interesting points here that, uh, that are important. One is. Yes, the value of OER. I'm, I'm, I'm getting uh, over the years. I've gotten more and more enthusiastic about about OER, and uh, have come, you know, reached the point now where I, uh, I, I think that's really probably a better fit for academic publishing of all kinds uh, than uh, uh, than than the uh, than than the other, you know, than the traditional model. Uh, having said that. Um, um, you know, we have the issue always. We have the issue of um, of uh, vetting uh, the resources, and uh, uh, if you are going to use OER, then you have to. Uh, uh, then you, as the professor in the course, I think have a, have have the responsibility to vet the resources and uh, um, uh, make sure that they are that they are that they're competently done. Uh, yeah, we saw a professor there. get in trouble at Michigan this week for showing a video he didn't screen right properly. So That's, you got to be yeah, really I, careful about this. You got to be screen. really careful about this. Yeah, you got to be really careful about this. You know, I would argue that uh, 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 constructivism really got off on the wrong foot, for example, because of uh, uh, because of what amounted to really sloppy refereeing. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the early stages of publication of the of the ideas, um, I also would argue that uh, 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 that the same thing should have happened, or maybe it did happen, with andragogy, uh, for example, uh, uh, and so on. And you know, it, uh, again, the the point the point is these ideas really got off, I, I think, on the wrong foot in the community as a whole. And um, and wound up as a result, in my mind, uh, more or less self-destructing uh, for reasons that could have been avoided. Uh, anyway, so so that's that's kind of one point. The uh, uh, you know OER does not have the refereeing uh, does not you cannot assume refereeing uh, has been done. Uh, responsible academic publishers do do that kind of refereeing. Uh, even for books, and uh, uh, and that's that's an, that's important. So that's kind of that you know that's kind of one point. The other point uh, is that once, I, uh, briefly, oh. the Commonwealth of Learning would be one place to go for the refereeing. So so that's a that has a whole crew that's involved in 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 in, uh, in refining all documents and verifying and, and re reviewing and making a highly qual high quality publications. So you have to find uh, the organizations like Educos. They, they don't mm -hmm. do the Horizons report without reviewing. So Educause, Commonwealth of Learning, UNESCO, World Bank, you, you know, you're, you're more likely to, 
to see the review process in place than other places. So just, you know, there might be a yeah. two tiered system to OER and stay right. with the first first tier for now. Um, it would yeah. be my opinion. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I think so. We, do, we don't do a good job or a good enough job in this field of, um, of two things. One is, you know, one is, uh, uh, is, is grounding our work uh, in general in, in what has come, uh, what has gone before us. Um, I always contrast, for example, uh, the tendency in education research to invent your own terms rather than grounding what your, your work and what has gone before. And I think one of the big underlying messages that of, of, of your talk about the uh, 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 about you know, historical precedence is you must ground your work in, in what has gone before. I happen to be married to a, uh, uh, to a PhD biochemist and she regularly uses in, in her work concepts and terms that have been around for 50 and 100 years. Uh, and, uh, and it would be absolutely unacceptable for anyone in her field to attempt to publish something by creating, uh, by just inventing a new term uh, for, their, for their work rather than using an existing term and linking to existing research. This is the discipline of cumulative knowledge building. And I think the underlying message of what you're, of what you're saying uh, about, talking to the, uh, about talking to our forebears, if you will, is this discipline of, is the discipline of cumulative knowledge building. Uh, we must ground what we what the work done now in in what has gone before. We must use those terms. We must uh, connect what we're doing to uh, uh, to work that has gone before. And uh, if you're not doing that, you're acting in an undisciplined manner, uh, and and you're and diminishing your contribution. So Kurt, uh, we have got one one minute yep. left. Could I see Alicia has mentioned ADA compliance when using OER resources? Could you spend the last minute maybe addressing ADA compliance? Well, I'll go back to I, I got the book on the bookshelf here, um, uh, a book from Susie Grunge, Seth, and Betsy Dalton, and and it's a it's an international book with uh, forty eight chapters from around the world, and and so that would be a way to start. I'd pick up that book from Rutledge. That you know that'd be you know, um, and, and there are there are other outlets, but it's the one that I helped her get up, get published and got her dead. So I'll, I'll recommend that one. Uh, it's just out last year. So, um, so I'd take a look at that and write to Susie at, at Houston. You guys are in North Texas. You're not too far away. Uh, bring her up, you know, if you, if you're, so we did, we brought Susie here to IU just to speak to faculty about uh, equipping their online courses to be ADA compliant. And so we had a whole, so I chair the committee on teaching and learning technology. We had a whole semester or a whole year where that was the focus. So if this is a concern of focus, you have to create some, you, it can't be a one-off thing. You know, you just, a book is fine, but it can't just be that. It's got, you got to change the culture, just like everything else. So it's got to be a systemic, you know? And so bringing her up would be one idea. Um, having conversations, having your own personal, you know, uh, departmental based discussions, having faculty showcases of what they've done to be ADA compliant. It's got to be all those things, mentoring programs, showcasing programs, resource books and whatnot, experts. It's got to be a, a combination approach. And so that's that's my answer to that. I mean, I, I could throw out a, a, a resource or two again, but it's always going to be a one off. Um, yeah. So. Uh, last name is Grunseth, G-R-O-N-S-E-T-H. Um, and you can, G-R-O-N-S-E-T-H. Other final, Kinchuk, you have a, uh, or Lynn, Kinchuk, do you have a comment to close us off with? Uh, what I would say is that thank you very much, Kurt, for a fantastic talk. And I um, mean, I keep, kept my video, of course, uh, close so that bandwidth is good, but I really appreciate it. Uh, it's very insightful and uh, certainly I know your work for, for a very long time, of course. So thank you. Thank you once again. I, I really appreciate you, you know, your advice. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting me. I've been doing this 80 shows. We have done a couple of keynotes actually about Silver Lining, but I've not done a talk. Uh, so we have done a couple of shows on what our favorite shows are, but I've not accumulated this. You forced me to, to put together 
and, and I've done talks on shared online video, but it's been a long time. So I've put together and, and updated and last night till three or four in the morning. Um, but now I've got that. So I appreciate that. So Lynn, I guess you get the final word since you're the one who invited me in. Uh, Lynn, thank you all. Well, thank you so much. Uh, they, you know, you definitely uh, inspired more. I have a lot of questions, but you know, we are not we are not going to have time, and uh, I will ask you some other time. But thank you so much. Uh, every time I, you know, listen to you, I um, just feel so much inspired, and I really like your spirit, the positive, you know, hopeful spirit. You know, especially in, like you said, in so many uh, negativities around us. Thank you.